Hello, I'm Eric Corman, Interim Co-CEO and Communications Director at League of Education Voters, and the parent of a high school freshman of the global majority in the public school system who is accessing special education services. This webinar features closed captions. To access captioning, just click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Spanish interpretation is also available. To access this webinar in Spanish, in your webinar controls at the bottom of your screen, click interpretation, which is the icon that looks like a globe, and then click Spanish. And if you want to hear only Spanish without the original English in the background, click mute original audio. Special thanks to Fanny Cordero, who is our interpreter. If you have any technical issues, feel free to use the chat function, which I will monitor throughout the webinar. In case you're not familiar with us, League of Education Voters is a statewide nonprofit working with families, educators and leaders to build a brighter future for every Washington student. Our website is educationvoters.org. We believe that education is a tool for justice. One of the systems that perpetuate racial injustice experienced by global majority communities is our schools. We believe every child deserves an excellent public education that provides equitable opportunities for success. In order to achieve this, we must pursue radical change in our school systems for equity, justice, and liberation. We must build schools and systems that honor the humanity of every student. Welcome to our free online webinar series, Lunchtime Webinars. We started this series nine years ago to share information and build knowledge on important and timely issues. Today's webinar is about life-saving skills, youth suicide prevention through social emotional learning. September is Suicide Prevention Month, an opportunity to reflect on our collective responsibility to prioritize mental health and well being and implement proactive strategies to prevent youth suicide. With youth suicide rates increasing and 22% of high schoolers seriously considering suicide within the past year, up from 16% in 2011, given the urgency of this issue, how can Washington State prioritize evidence-based investments in prevention for all young people? Social emotional learning is a powerful and cost-effective intervention to equip young individuals with essential skills tied to protective factors that play a pivotal role in reducing the likelihood of developing suicidal thoughts and behaviors. During this webinar, we will share the impacts of social emotional learning on youth suicide prevention and discuss possible pathways forward for Washington State to address this ongoing crisis. And now I would like to invite our panelists to introduce themselves, starting with our students. Stacy, why don't you go first, and then you can uh, ping pong to uh, Micah, and then Micah, feel free to popcorn to um, our next panelist. So hi, I'm Stacy Osoria. I live in Seattle, Washington, but I attend Shorewood High School in the Shoreline School District. I am a part of the Washington Legislative Youth Advisory Council. It's a council comprised of 18 to 24 youth from Washington all across the state, and we are the official youth voice to the legislature. And I'll pass it to Micah. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, okay. Can. My name is Micah Fitzgerald. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm also on the Legislative Youth Advisory Council. I am 17 and I attend Richland High School in Richland School District. I will pass it on to Megan. Thank you, Micah. Um, and nice to meet both you and Stacy. Thank you for being here. Um, I know it is a busy time of year for students. Um, my name is Megan. I am the school-based suicide prevention um, director at Forefront. So all of our initiatives here at Forefront Suicide Prevention that touch K-12 education are under my purview. Um, and we work across multiple spaces in schools, with community members, with the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction on state level committees, um, advocating for social emotional learning, suicide prevention, and mental health and well-being for all of our youth in Washington. And I'll pass it to Jordan. Thank you, Megan. Hello, everybody. I'm Jordan Pazimentier. I'm the Vice President of Committee for Children, and I'm focused on policy and advocacy. Uh, Committee for Children is a 45-year-old nonprofit mission to advance safety and well-being uh, for children. And we do that a number of ways through um, programmatic services, research, 
public awareness campaigns and my work, which mostly uh, is designed to advance legislation in support of these policies. Uh, I'm a former public school teacher. I'm a lawyer. I'm also a dad. And these issues are uh, near and dear to me. And I'll pass it over to Dr. Kim. Hi, everyone. I am Tia Kim. I am the Vice President of Education Research and Impact at Committee for Children and Colleague of Jordan. Uh, uh, you know, our organization really has a beginning in research. It's founded by researchers. And so a lot of the work we do has um, research foundations and use it to translate it into our programming, to think about um, best practices and of educator training and also our policy and advocacy work. So really excited to be here. I'm also a parent, actually, of two teenage boys in middle school and high school. So again, um, very important um, topic to talk about. Great. Thank you all for being here. And, and uh, Megan, it sounds like you're the parent of, of children also. I should have said that. Um, yes. So I come to my work at Forefront um, as a history with as an educator. I was a school counselor for a number of years, um, but I'm a mom of three, um, all with their own neurodiverse profiles, all with IEPs um, in our local public school system. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. To begin today's webinar, I would like to acknowledge that we're on the ancestral and unceded traditional lands of the 29 federally recognized and non-federally recognized tribes in Washington state, including the Chehalis, Chinook, Colville, Cowlitz, Ho, Jamestown Sklalem, Kalispell, Lower Elwha Clallam, Lummi, Macaw, Muckleshoot, Nisqually, Nooksack, Port Gamble Sklalem, Puyallup, Quileut, Quinault, Samish, Soxwiatl, Shoalwattle Bay, Skokomish, Snoqualmie, Spokane, Squaxin Island, Stiligwamish, Suquamish, Swinomish, Tulalip, Upper Skagit, and Yakima. We give thanks to elders both past and present, our native and indigenous colleagues, and the land itself. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. You'll notice a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. This is a space for you to submit questions to us. If time permits, we'll have about 10 minutes for questions after the panel discussion wraps up. As always, feel free to send any feedback about the webinar quality to us on the chat function or at info at educationvoters.org. And speaking of the chat function, you're welcome to use it to check in and comment on anything you hear. Welcome, Micah, Micah Stacy, Megan, Dr. Kim, and Jordan. We're going to start with a question just to level set. And um, Stacy and Micah, feel free to jump in anytime with questions or insights. And it's, it's always great when you talk to each other. So the first question is, what is social emotional learning? I'm happy to lead us in on that, Eric. Uh, we have a slide, just so you have both uh, what we have to say as well as the visual to help orient you to the answer to that question. And I'll hand it to Tia to go over this in a little bit more detail. Yeah, so um, you could think about social emotional learning in a lot of different ways. Actually, the field talks about it in a lot of different ways and defines it in, in many, many other ways. But um, at Committee for Children, we really lean on um, CASEL, which is the Collaborative on Academic and Social Emotional Learning. They, define social emotional learning um, using five different competencies is what you see on the screen. So self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, self-awareness, and responsible decision-making. And there are a myriad or various skills that you can actually teach that fall into each of these competencies. Um, but the way I really like to think about it is that I feel like there are very essential life skills that are important for both young people and adults including myself, to be successful not only in school, but outside of school in the workplace. And so there are a host of, like I said, skills that fall into these competencies. So like self-management, I told you I had teenage boys. Um, I talk about that every day um, with my high schooler this morning, actually, when he was late for school. And I said, you could have just woke up five minutes earlier. That's a self-management skill, right? Being able to plan and organize your time. So again, they are five different competencies and there's different skills within each of them. And when you talk of, and we'll probably talk about it later, but I think there are different skills that are important that could be protective factors around suicide prevention. 
Yeah, and what is a protective factor, just for folks who don't know? Um, it's typically some sort of skill or factor that helps um, support or promote behavior that might um, prevent you from engaging in something that we don't really want um, young people or adults to engage in, right? So um, if you're talking about su suicide, it might be you know, su suicidal ideation, right? What are their known sort of protective mechanisms that we know through research that might prevent kids from doing that. And, and when I think about those protective factors in suicide prevention and just mental health in general for our young people, that is often feeling connected and having a sense of belonging. And part of having that connection is understanding self and context of their own community and their own identity. Um, having caregivers, parents, teachers, educators, coaches who care, who listen. Um, but it's also about having basic needs met, having access to physical and mental health care, um, having the ability to um, ask for help when you need it and have that be acknowledged and listened to, um, and then be able to like, follow through with it, right? Get the care that you need when you need it. Um, and in suicide prevention, specifically, a skill we talk about a lot is um, lethal means safety. Like if we can reduce access to lethal means, we are protecting our community um, just in the same way we protect our community by wearing seatbelts when we drive. Yeah, Derek, can I, yeah, let me, let me add to it because I really want to connect the the prevention of youth suicide with these pro-social skill building opportunities. I, I, I'm going to share a slide with you again. Based on uh, some uh, literature review that we conducted back in 2018 and published in the peer-reviewed journal in 2019, if you think about the most significant risk factors associated with youth suicide, you'll find hopelessness, anxiety, substance use, and child sexual abuse really as those driving dominant factors we must attend to. And you can think about those five competencies Tia talked about and Megan discussed in more concrete detail as ways to prevent or stave off or mitigate some of those risk factors. And you'll see the association. So for example, in the review, we identified uh, to stave off hopelessness, some of the interventions under self-awareness and self-management and relationship skills can really serve that pro-social domain. Same thing if you look at anxiety, you'll see all across the board, any number of those competencies can be built with students to stave off anxiety that can be associated and lead to suicidality. And so you see this very close relationship that occurs between these two domains, social emotional learning and youth suicide prevention. Yeah, that's I really just wanted to add to, to, you know, to link what <clears throat> Jordan just said and what Megan said earlier is that um, the, that sense of belonging and connectedness is super important for suicide prevention, but it also can really be fostered with really good social emotional learning programs in schools, right? So there was a recent actual meta analysis that came out, and when they looked at um, kids who received programming in schools versus not, one of the main things that they found to have a positive outcome was around improving school climate and culture. Right, so that there's something about implementing a social emotional learning program in a school space that can really help with that belonging piece, that helping kids feel included, and that kind of thing. And I just recently heard a study um, looking at LGBTQ youth, and um, one of the biggest protective factors around suicide um, ideation was actually just having one, just one caring adult in a school. If they felt that they had one caring adult, it dramatically de decreased that. So again, it's that belongingness, connectedness, and I think SCL really helps to build sort of communities like that. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Stacy, Micah, do you have any questions or comments about social emotional learning? Um, well, I think something that's like super interesting about what was shown is that a lot of these skills are just generally more like neurotypical things I feel like that are taught more in like those types of spaces so I feel like it's super difficult like again to like find those types of communities because like when you're neurodivergent I feel like in schools especially public schools they don't really 
kind of cater towards that. And like a lot of like the ways that you build community are like at school dances and school functions and like very overstimulating events. And so it's hard to like get those types of communities and make them feel like they belong when nothing is really being catered towards them. So that kind of made me think of that when you guys were talking about that. I also wanted to add a comment. My school just implemented a SEL program um, required for all students to go this year. And from what I've seen so far, I think this is a really good way for students to develop um, a relationship with the teachers that are running these programs in their classrooms. Because I, for example, I feel like I didn't really have much of a connection or that caring teacher that at my school that I can confide in when I need it. And this program is really helping. So I think having SEL in um, educational spaces is a really beneficial program to add. Yeah, thank you so much. And Stacy, you, you bring up a good point about neurodivergent students. Um, my son is autistic and I'm wondering, are there programs, SEL programs that, that are more tailored for students with disabilities? And what would those look like? Yeah, for me, I have a brother who has autism and we attend the same school. We obviously have the same living situation at home and it's so much more difficult for him to get involved than it was for me to get involved. We were both new to the Shoreline District and it's nothing against the district at all. It's just the way that the school is made and the way that the funds are allocated and things that are like targeted because neurodivergent students are a minority. And since there's so many neurotypical students, um, it's hard to cater towards that. And also neurodivergent students kind of have other things that they need to be worrying about. And they focus more on teaching them like English and math rather than kind of like catering that emotional side to them. And so I think like having a brother who goes through the same thing as me and the same like life experiences outside of school, just and seeing the two different ways that we can be treated when we're walking in the hallway right next to each other. I can have like five people say hi to me and no one will say hi to him. And he has struggled with mental health before. And so it like, you can, I see the difference and I can feel it even just walking around. So it definitely, like the social emotional learning stuff, I have it more like in my brain, but I know for him, it's a little bit more difficult. Oh, I was just gonna say, thank you for sharing that reflection. It's so powerful. And I think it is true of a lot of our students. I mean, I, talk with my kids at home all the time about like my role as their parent is to help them become fully functioning humans in whatever that means for each of them and for each of them that looks different um and I think there are aspects of that phrase for me that is really true when you're talking about social emotional learning or building life skills in schools um where you have to be able to meet the person, the people, the community, where they're at. Um, and so like you think about my eighth grader who has a study skills class as one of her electives to support her learning. And as part of that class, they have a daily circle. Um, it is, they're not necessarily following the curriculum or guidance, but they are having that daily moment of connection to check in to be seen as their authentic individuals. And then they move into the skills-based portion or the study support that they are needing. And so I think about how do we get creative when students need different things and some social emotional learning packages come as kind of a boxed curriculum. So how do you get thoughtful or nimble even in helping things fit for everyone. Yeah, that's definitely the question. Now, the next question that I have is about the way that social emotional learning works between education and healthcare settings. I mean, some youth suicide prevention work happens in a clinical setting with mental health professionals, and some of it happens in schools with school staff, where some staff are and some are not mental health professionals. How does all this work? I can lead us into that because uh, it raises a lot of policy issues that I, I think we'll probably talk about a little later. Uh, 
when you get to a, well, first of all, we can say as a country that our, our kids are really struggling, right? We've, we've heard the Surgeon General uh, call attention to the need to attend to student mental health and wellness because the reports on the increased numbers that you cited at the beginning, Eric, are, are quite concerning, quite disturbing. Uh, so with a countrywide uh, crisis, if we can construct it that way, uh, we know that the healthcare sector is really taxed with responding adequately to the challenge at hand. There aren't enough mental health care professionals to serve the reported need that students have, uh, have shown. And if we try to respond through small group or one-on-one -on -one interventions, we're probably not going to ameliorate the challenge. What we need, at least as a foundation, is something that reaches all kids. And where is a good place to find all kids? Well, we find them in a school setting. Does it all have to be medical in nature? No, a lot of this work we've been doing for years in a non-medical way, led by non-medical personnel in a non-medical setting called school. And if you lay that foundation, building those life skills that we're talking about, you can actually make it more manageable for mental health professionals to have effective response. It has uh, fewer students might need to seek that medical attention, or if they do, Perhaps it can be a more productive conversation with your mental health professional. So there's, there's a separation, but we know they're quite uh, integrated at the end of the day, right? We know we need more school counselors, social workers, psychologists, and this should be an all hands on deck exercise where we ask school staff, educators, principals, families, all to participate in building pro-social factors for prevention. Yeah, Megan, uh, Dr. Kim, anything you'd like to add? I was trying not to unmute and insert myself and talk over Dr. Kim. She was going to unmute as well. Um, at Forefront, um, our, our mission is to help people take action to prevent suicide in their communities. Um, our people is anyone. Um, and so I think there are lots of things that all different kinds of folks can do in their communities, in their social spheres, in their individual spheres of influence that can make a positive impact, that can bring in those protective factors for our young people. Um, and I think it, that goes back, right, to those protective factors we were talking earlier, right? Micah is sharing wow, this new program in my school is helping me finally feel connected to an, an educator in my building. I've never had that before. And we know that's hugely protective. Um, and so I think one of the things that I think people get scared about is like, I'm not a clinician. I can't talk about mental health. I can't talk about suicide. But I'm Suicide and mental health impact all of us. It is an innately human condition, just like someone breaking their arm or scraping their knee on the playground. Um, we all have ups and downs. And so if we can talk about those openly and often, and we can equip all the people in the building to know what to do when things get real or hard. Um, I think we are protecting folks more than we, um, than we might give our, each other credit for. Um, and so, and I think sometimes, especially for educators of young children, um, having conversations about suicide is really scary. So how do we then make sure that they have the training and the professional development that they need to feel like they are skillfully entering conversation that might be difficult or scary or challenging or hard. I would say too, it's also about the framing, right? So I think there is a place for healthcare providers that are clinicians to do the work that is really important that they do. And then there's a, a role for schools and educators, right? So again, going back to social emotional learning, sometimes educators Get, like you said, maybe get it like I'm not like trained as a clinician, but 
you can actually do a lot of things to just build real connections and relationships with your students. And that is part of your role as an educator. And like we just said, that is super important protective factor. So again, it's about the frame and like, what can you do that we know through research and best practice and evidence that says by doing these things, that is clearly a part of your role, what you are able to do um, can help protect and prevent suicide, I think is a good way. Now, I know one way of, of categorizing the amount of help that can be given to students is different tiers of support. How does that work? I could tell you a little bit. So in schools, um, a lot of schools use uh, multi-tiered systems of support. Um, and so there's kind of a universal tier that is for all kind of students or um, general ed type students. And then there's um, tier two, for, when I'm talking about like social emotional learning, it might be those students that need a little extra support um, and that manifests itself differently in every school. So it could be that they're pulled out into smaller groups um, and, and do some activities that way with the school counselor. And then there's a third tier where they need um, more kind of dedicated interventions. And that typically happens one on one. In one -on -one setting would be those school counselors, school psychologists. They also do it for academics as well. They have um, tiered systems of support as well. So, yes. Um, and there's different kind of programming you can do with the different tiers. <clears throat> yeah, great. Um, Stacy, Micah, do you have any questions or comments about how school and, and medical healthcare settings integrate with social emotional learning? Okay, well, let's move on to the next question, which is what is still needed in current Washington state landscape and policy and practice to address youth suicide prevention? Oh, could I lead us into that one, Eric? I thought you might want to. All right, great, because, uh, you know, I got the policy hat on. Might as well talk to you about it. Uh, I'll go back to sharing my screen real quick. Uh, this is really high level general stuff in Washington state. Think of, uh, in terms of what we have for youth suicide prevention, ample state to local coordination and training and support around youth suicide. Uh, Forefront is built into the code sections, making sure that they connect with our government intermediaries, our educational service districts, and we have some funding to make sure that we are capacitated to carry out youth suicide prevention initiatives. So that's youth suicide prevention. What about social emotional learning? Well, we have developed state-level social-emotional learning standards that look very much like those Castle 5 competencies. We have six in our state, uh, including social engagement as an additional sixth. Uh, we have a mandate in K through 3 to implement social-emotional learning. And we have some limited grant programs and state-level technical assistance to help districts figure this out and, and, and get it going really well. But notice these are two separate bullets. These do not live together. The province of youth suicide prevention and social emotional learning uh, are fairly separate. And one of the things that we're missing in uh, youth suicide prevention and what we need at state level is to build that skill-based set of activities into prevention efforts for all youth, not just those who require tier two or tier three interventions for the purpose of prevention, for the purpose of reducing and mitigating those risk factors that we saw earlier. Now, uh, Eric, you did ask about what are the tiers. There are often, there are also different layers of prevention. And we talk about primary prevention. And that's important because it's what you do before any of those risks start to show themselves. Primary is like the equivalent of each of fruit and vegetables so you don't get sick. There's also secondary prevention. That's where those more intensive interventions are important. But if you don't lay that primary level, that primary foundation with tier one, again, it's going to be very taxing on our healthcare sector, on those mental health professionals, and we're not going to get the outcome we want. So tier one, primary prevention, skill-based interventions, Integrating social emotional learning with youth suicide prevention is an opportunity for our state to consider to make sure we get the kids where they need to go. Yeah, and along those lines, uh, Stacy and Micah, 
what do you think Washington State should do beyond what's currently being done to prevent youth suicide? I have to agree with Jordan. I think that a lot of what he said is very right. Um, definitely training people, especially like teachers and also peers. I know for my school, we do the UW Forefront training every year to the freshmen. And then we do um, a sort of modified training for uh, seniors in their civics courses. And that really helps open discussion, I feel like, because especially for minority students, um, you don't really have conversations about mental health at home. It's just is something that's super stigmatized and kind of when you bring it up, especially we do peer training. So we have a peer teaching about suicide prevention and peers listening. It's a very welcoming space. I feel like sometimes it's super intimidating to talk to an adult about it. Um, and so when you open those kind of spaces of vulnerability where you're like, this is like, like even saying the word suicide out loud really gets a lot of people emotional and uncomfortable. I remember when I was learning my training, I like didn't really want to say it and I wanted to start laughing and kind of like push it away. And I think as a society and as like a group of people, once we learn to get comfortable with the word suicide and learn to get comfortable talking about it is when we're actually going to be able to make a change and like actually get to the primary source of like what's causing the suicide rates to go up. So yeah, that's my thoughts on it for now. Micah, you can go ahead and talk. Okay, I agree with Jordan and Stacey. I think that it is super important to prioritize early intervention and accessible mental health services for youth. Um, I think it's also super important to bridge the gaps in the mental health support and increase awareness and also promote collaborations with schools with resources that are targeted to helping children um, slash youth um, deal with their mental health issues and um, create a way to, one second, sorry. Create a way to effectively, you know, prevent youth suicidal rates. Also, I wanted to add in one more thing after Micah, because I just thought of it. I think something that we also kind of neglect in the talk of suicide prevention is student extracurriculars. There's so much pressure on students to be a part of 50 million different things. And I think especially in terms of student athletes, there's been a lot of suicide um, happening there. I worded that really poorly, but I hope you guys get what I'm trying to say. And I think that especially with like coaches and like the social pressure in high school to be that varsity athlete to always be competing. Um, I'm doing varsity volleyball this year. And after games, sometimes my peers will come up and critique my playing. And then it does make people go down. And I think that kind of, I know that like teachers and educators and stuff like that, but also people who are working within the district and working in that realm with students should also be trained on suicide prevention and social emotional learning, because you are working with these students and you're also during like sports seasons. I know for my district, at least they're every day. So you're spending a lot of time and dedicating a lot of time there. And I think that sometimes some coaches are just not adequately trained or have knowledge on that type of stuff. Yeah, we have a comment in the Q&A from Francis. Thank you, Francis, saying that we need to destigmatize mental health and suicide and also be proactive rather than reactive. How can we destigmatize mental health and suicide though? Yes, talk about it more, but are there other things that we can do? I mean, one of the things I think we can do is, is really expect and demand that life skills and social emotional learning are a needed and necessary part of school. Um, I mean, we, if we equip our students with all the reading, writing, and math skills they need to go on to the future, but we don't also allow them to practice and fail and figure out who they are as humans, then I think we're really doing them a disservice. Um, I also think parents and caregivers and community organizations that work with youth are often a missing component of this prevention. Like our young people live in community. 
And yes, school is definitely where they spend a ton of time, but they also spend a ton of time at home and a ton of time in their sports practices or their choirs or their theater groups and making sure that um, all of the folks, right, are able, like they have the tools in their toolbox needed, um, not only to take care of themselves, but to help take care of someone else when something is wrong um, is so important. And so when I think about social emotional learning, there's part of me as an educator and someone who led PEPS groups for newborns, babies, and their families, like that, that group, right, normalizes the trials and tribulations of having an itty bitty baby for the first time. And it gives folks a sense of belonging and community during a time that is hard. Um, I think about, man, what about the parents of middle schoolers <laughs> and teenagers? or um, kids who have really significant needs that are maybe not being met by our school system. How do we make sure that everyone has a place in their community to learn the tools and tricks and skills um, to not only help their children, but to like help themselves? Yeah, I like the way you say that. And that actually tees us up for our next question, which is, what is still needed in the current Washington state landscape to address policy and practice in social emotional learning? I'm happy to give a few, a few thoughts. So we're, as I was saying earlier, we're, we're missing that connectivity between in-school skill building and the larger province of youth suicide prevention. Also, uh, you heard the benefits that Michael was reporting on having this as a mandate in her school, but it's not a mandate everywhere outside of K through three. And schools sometimes need the, the incentive to pursue this work and to organize it as part of the learning day so that students can get access. So we need uh, basic things like that encouragement at the state level, the integration with other interventions like youth suicide prevention, and the capacity to carry it out well. So we have a related question in the chat here, which is, what are your thoughts on making SEL a part of basic education, thus guaranteed by the state constitution? Oh, there's a wonky term in there, basic education. So uh, basic education means something specific in, <laughs> in Washington state. But let me start with the idea that all learning is social and emotional. It's, it's core to teaching and learning. Kids don't learn in social or emotional vacuums, and they cannot learn in social or emotional chaos. You have to attend to this if you want your students to learn and learn well. So in some sense, it's already core, but is it basic? Is it something that the state claims responsibility over in carrying out our project of public education? And that's the question that we should answer by saying, well, if you don't do this, you're not gonna have kids thriving in school and then work in life thereafter. So the question is more to me, like how do you put it into basic education? Because it surely seems like it needs to be there if we want excellent teaching and learning, not just to improve student mental health and prevent suicide, but work on academic excellence. Make sure that kid who's going to volleyball is ready to go, understands how to be a good winner, and how to continue to thrive in the face of uh, you know, the other team winning. It, it, it's, it's absolutely core and it deserves to be part of basic education. And, and I would say it also needs to be funded, right? And so, right, we know that our schools right now are not fully funded. And so what I also, I, as a former educator, like we can't just also pile it on and expect schools to do everything, especially if it is an unfunded mandate. So how do we make sure that if this is as important as I really think it is, as all of us are saying that it is, how do we fund, fund it fully? How do we make sure that the future upcoming educators are getting the appropriate training as part of their pre-service education and practicum? How do we make like, professional development in this arena um, widely available 
um, to our educators, to our ESAs, to our school nurses, our school psychs, our recess monitors, um, our families, um, how, and how do we partner across communities and across silos to recognize that there are so many funding streams that fund prevention. Um, and I go back to that, that chart, right, that we shared at the beginning about you know, substance use prevention and anxiety, mental health, like all of those things are interrelated, but oftentimes they are funded in very discrete buckets that can't overlap. So how can we really think about creating systems for our young people that are integrative, um, that talk to each other, that are connecting, <laughs> um, so suicide prevention doesn't just have to talk about suicide, but it can also talk about anxiety, depression, mental health, and prevention, and substance use. Um, and that money can be shared across um, areas. Yeah, I, I like the sound of that. Uh, Stacy, Micah, do you have any comments or questions before we open it up to the audience to ask other questions? Um, I was going to agree with Megan. I think that it is so important that we don't overload, overload our teachers on so many different things just because they have so, much, so many responsibilities already. And I know for my school, we have a very high student to teacher ratio. And so knowing that if we're going to be putting a lot of the pressure on teachers to like make sure that all of their students are mentally well, we need to make sure that our teachers are mentally able to be dealing with all of the pressure of caring for over 150 students that they're gonna see all the time. So that's, yeah. And Stacey, that our teachers are mentally well. I don't know how many folks listening and who are part of this panel today know educators in their life, but there are, I would argue that educators and youth are struggling in pretty equal amounts right now. Yeah, and, and it's funny you mentioned that, Megan, because there's a question uh, right now about that. It says students cannot learn if they're dysregulated, and the same goes for teachers who are dysregulated. They can't teach. How can we support teachers' mental health right now beyond employee benefits to seek outside therapy? Social emotional learning comes into play there too, right? Like I said in the very beginning, when you said, what is SEL? I said it's for, for youth and for adults, right? Even myself, I think it I don't think you're ever done developing those skills and competencies. You're ever evolving and ever working on them. Um, and so I'm um, thinking about how um, we can train educators to also tune into their own social and emotional learning competencies and, and think about them and improve them because, yeah, so um, be better educators, right? I always try to use this really simple example. You can't, like, you know, tell one of your students like you need to like get your emotions in check and regulate while you're yelling at them at the same time right so um you know they have to regulate their own emotions so i think that's really important yeah i like that uh, micah did you have any questions or comments before i open it up to more questions no comments as of right now Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jordan and Megan and Dr. Kim and Stacy and Micah. We have about five-ish minutes for questions. So if you're listening, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. No question is too basic. And the first question is, has online access contributed to mental and emotional negativity that could result in damage to self-esteem and result in thoughts of suicide? What can parents and schools do to limit time on devices? And I'm sure Stacy and Micah, you've got opinions about this too. Yeah, um, I think social media and phone time has definitely um, increased negative self-esteem. I think that there's so many times where you're socializing on social media and it's just scrolling through TikTok for hours. And I think that sometimes, especially because the algorithm is just insane if you're feeling sad for a few minutes your whole algorithm you start liking the sad videos and then you find yourself in a tunnel of sad content and the more that you indulge in the sad content the sadder you get and then it's hard to get out of it because 
that's all the algorithm is giving you. And then it's hard to like find those happy videos that social media is supposed to give you, if that makes sense. So I think it's hard because everyone is on social media and it almost is normal to send your friend a depressing TikTok. That's like, I'm just so sad right now. And it has a funny meme crying in the background and you almost dismiss it because it's not seen as serious because it's a meme on TikTok. So I think social media definitely, um, it downplays mental health so much and it's hard because everyone's on it. And I don't think that schools can necessarily take away social media in that sense, but it's also, it's just a difficult thing. I feel like. I, I wish there was a mic drop reaction right now because I think Stacy uh, answered that question beautifully. Yeah, I would agree. I have another question, which is, why has there been, especially recently, so much pushback to social emotional learning? What is behind that and what can we do about it? I can, uh, and my two cents and then Jordan could probably add more to see if you would like. Um, I think honestly, it just comes like it's pretty base, like basic, right? I think there's a misunderstanding or representation of what it really is. Um, because like I said, there was a lot in the very beginning, there's lots of definitions around it. People have their own um, misconstructions of it. It comes from the term is like it, on the face of it. It doesn't, people are like, what is that? And it comes from academia research. But I think once you accept explain it to people like I like very simply like if they're just really basic life skills that are important for kids to have and if you kind of describe what they are I would say the majority of people really um, agree with that and actually we recently did some polling with families across the country and like overwhelmingly almost you know 98 over 80 percent of parents firmly believed it was important and that it should be taught in schools so um I think it's uh, to me, it seems like there's a misunderstanding around what it is. I don't know if Jordan has any other ideas from kind of the political side. Oh, yeah. I see it that way, uh, just just as you do. Uh, I, I, everything's so politicized these days, and it's it feels especially pronounced in education. I, I think that the pandemic in particular really, really damaged us in, in our efforts to keep working on, on public education. So... Uh, concepts that were unfamiliar were, were going to get attacked and uh, without necessarily understanding what those those concepts refer to in a, in a classroom setting and, and so social emotion learning was not spared from that experience that we're having as a country until you have that conversation that that T is talking about just actually go over what it looks like in a classroom you know, a student sits down for a math test, is experiencing anxiety. What are some of the techniques to challenge that anxiety, to focus on that test so they can ace it or be okay if they don't? Uh, they get into a fight in the hallway. There's conflict going on in the brain and, and suddenly they're asked to do algebra two. What do you think is gonna happen? And, and we have a term for that. Why? Because we've got three decades of research that show us how to do it well. And it helps to have a term to refer to that three decades worth of research, as well as point as a, as a point of focus so that educators and students can work on this thing together. I, I think, I mean, I, I'll just add in um, that I think when we talk about social emotional learning as life skills, um, I don't think anyone who is a parent or has worked with young people um, or who is even an adult right now, uh, doesn't believe that having life skills is important. Uh, and, and I think what has the challenges, the linchpin is that the term social emotional learning has been politicized and has been politicized incorrectly. Uh, and so like, I don't know, I, I just think about how words and the words we choose have so much power. Um, and sometimes we're all just talking about the same thing, but we can't actually agree that we are because of the emotional reaction or response um, to something that might be political or um, swing one way or another. Um, yeah. yeah, 
Yeah, thanks for that. Go, oh, go ahead, Stacey. Yeah, I was going to say, I also just think that maybe some people, they're not very knowledgeable on the fact that it's not currently being taught. I think that, so my brother has autism and he has um, a life schools course and they teach him a lot of these things. And I'm in my standard honors classes and I don't get taught these life skills. And a lot of people just assume that you learn them naturally or you get them on your own. And I think that that's super difficult because you really don't, you don't learn stuff that way not everything comes naturally to everyone and so when I do struggle on a test I the first time I failed a test I broke down I could not mentally emotionally deal with that it set me back like two weeks where I like could not deal with the fact that I had failed and even though my brother is considered autistic well he is autistic but even though he's considered to be behind um, emotionally and socially he has a way better understanding of his feelings and his own emotions than I do because he's actually taught it. And so I think it's really, people don't understand that stuff like that isn't gonna come naturally to everyone, even though some people assume that it does. And I do think that it's been super politicized and like, yeah, I think it's just super unfortunate because then you see honor students that when they do start to fall behind, they can't deal with it. And then that leads to academic um, problems and stuff like that. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, I have time for one more question and then everyone will have a chance for last words and we'll end with Stacy and Micah as students to have the, the last, last words. But the, the, the question I have here is, what do we who are watching this webinar right now need to do to make sure that we do see social emotional learning everywhere where it needs to be? Are there tools that we can employ at the state level? Are there things we can do at the district level? Are there things we can do at the school building level? What, kind of, what could that look like? Oh, okay. Um, there are a number of state level, level subcommittees that would welcome public participation um, that are focused on the, the well-being of children and youth in Washington. Uh, you can go and listen. Uh, there is always a period of, for public comment. All of the notes and resources and um, meeting agendas are publicly posted, um, that is one way. Um, being an involved community member, going, listening in on your school board meetings, writing your local representatives, having a conversation with your school board leaders, voting, <laughs> um, using, exercising that right. Um, but I think also like showing up in your community and recognizing that like, perhaps if you have time, right? Showing up for lunch duty in your kiddos community is maybe a protective factor. Showing up at, to be involved or engaged in a PTA exercise builds belonging and community. So how do you continue to elevate that as much as you can, as often as you can? And I'll toss it back to Jordan. Some of what Megan is describing, I've come to understand can be a little daunting for folks who haven't engaged in it before. Uh, Committee for Children uh, has a lot of opportunity for you if you wanna figure out how to get in this uh, advocacy space a little more, we, we can scaffold you into it. Uh, you can join us if you go to the Committee for Children web pages, find advocacy and sign up. You will bring to your attention when there are opportunities, particularly at a state level, to uh, articulate why this matters to you, to your lawmaker, because they need to hear from you. If they don't hear from you, how are they going to know? And, and we make it as, as easy as possible. It's really not that hard. These folks are just like you. They shop at the same supermarkets you do. And, and as, uh, as a, uh, you know, an elected representative, that's kind of their job. Uh, and at the same time, yes, just like what Megan's saying, your school boards need to hear this. They need to hear that you care about this, that it's a value for, for you and your community. Because again, if, if they don't hear it, uh, then they won't know it, and it's it's liable to get sidelined, which is the last thing we want. So you'll get a, you know a, a newsletter from us. We're happy to work with you. Of course, Eric at the League of Education Voters does a great job of of sending around information, what's going on at the at the Capitol, and and what we all can be thinking about bigger picture. Uh, really easy, powerful ways for you to lift your voice and get involved. 
Great, thank you. So now we have time for last words. Um, Jordan, Megan, uh, Dr. Kim, are there any last words you would like to share before we move to Stacy and Micah to, to wrap us up? I guess I would just say, I think for in anything, like when we're talking about children and youth and, and encouraging positive or supporting positive outcomes, that everything has to be done in partnership, right? Like nothing can be done in a silo. We talked a little bit earlier about you know, the partnership between um, mental health and health care and schools, like how those overlap. I think even talking about um, how you do stuff in partnership with um, legislators, for instance, um, what Jordan was talking about, I participate there. And then also, I think when you're talking about um, conducting or implementing social emotional learning programs in schools, that is a partnership, right, between students and educators and families. It's like you have to all work together. So, and it really does take everybody to help try to promote the positive outcomes for kids. I think that's kind of last awesome. I think one of the things that I just want to underscore is we have a lot of um, policies, procedures, mandates um, that are asked of our schools and school districts and our educators. Um, a number of them are unfunded. Um, so there is not dedicated staffing or FTE allocated to meet all of those demands that we have asked for along the way. Um, I think about our RCW for recognition, screening, and response of emotional behavioral distress in our students. Um, that is required of every school district in Washington, but there is not necessarily funded support to assist schools and school districts in building out those documents. Um, so how do we like put our money where our mouth is? And if we're going to ask things of our educators, of our schools, of our communities, how can we make sure that they have the appropriate support to get those things done and to make those things meaningful and impactful? That's, that's totally it, Megan. We need meaningful policy, which means funded policy to do these community connected efforts that Tia is talking about in classroom and around classroom so that we can all work on this together. And there's a way to do it through, through the state legislature to make sure those funds become available, to make sure that these policies are connected, to make sure they can be sustained and placed in every classroom in our state. Great. Stacy, Micah, what last words do you have for us? Um, just listening to everyone, it was super impactful. And I think that one thing that I feel like was kind of left out of the conversation, just like towards the end a little bit was obviously the accessibility, like obviously everything's there. But I think if you have the time to speak up for the people who can't, I think that that's a really big thing. A lot of these information things are mostly promoted in English. And we obviously have a lot of people who don't speak English struggling with mental health in our school systems. And also people who can't even get the willingness to get out of bed every day. Speaking up for those people who don't have that mental capacity to do so, I think is just really important. And so if you're listening to this webinar and you have the time and you have the ability to mentally, physically, to go out and speak out, I think is really important. I agree, Stacy. And to wrap up, I would say after our discussion that, you know, social emotional learning is extremely important. And I believe, as we discussed earlier, that it is misunderstood to a lot of people, but people need to really understand that this is a way of building community and getting the chance to interact with others and being able to understand yourself and really um get the chance to develop relationships with people so that you can have a safe space in your community. Yeah, amen to that. 
Thank you, Micah, Stacy, Megan, Dr. Kim, and Jordan. And thanks to all of you for participating and submitting questions. Special thanks to our partners, Committee for Children and the Washington State Legislative Youth Advisory Council, also known as LIAC. Their websites are cfchildren.org and walayac.org. Our next webinar will take place next month and will focus on advancing educator diversity at the district and school building level. We're working to confirm panelists and the registration link will be on our website, educationvoters.org. Spanish interpretation and closed captioning in English will be available. Also, don't miss our free Youth Advocacy Summit and Fall Fest next Sunday, October 8th at Highline College and on Zoom. And Stacy, thank you for being part of the design team, by the way, on that. This is an event for youth, by youth, co-hosted by the Community Center for Education Results, CCER, League of Education Voters, LEV, and a team of youth partners from across the state, such as Stacy with LIAC. And uh, Micah, I, I think you were part of that too, if I remember right. Alongside our youth partners, we invite students, parents, leaders, and members of the community to come listen, learn, and participate in the events that students are putting on. Learn from their experiences with school, see what issues they're passionate about. Listen to and honor their hopes for the future. Whether you're a young person yourself or another member of the community, we invite you to join us as we hear from students, families, and community members. Info is on our website on the events page and will be sent to you in the follow-up email, which you should receive in about 24 hours. Big thanks to our sponsors, Microsoft, College Spark Washington, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thank you to each of you for joining us today. If you have additional questions or comments, please send them to me at eric at educationvoters.org. That's A-R-I-K at educationvoters.org. A recording of today's presentation and the presentation slides will be available on our website, educationvoters.org, and will be sent to you in the follow-up email. Please feel free to share the recording with your friends and colleagues. If you'd like to learn more about League of Education Voters or support our work, just visit our website. Thank you again for attending. Each one of us has the right to feel safe and valued. Together, we will fight for a world in which true educational and economic equity exists. We look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Micah, Stacy, Megan, Dr. Kim, and Jordan, thank you for all you do for Washington students and families. Thank you for joining us, and may you have a great rest of your week. Thank you.